I'm going to start the meeting. My name is Kevin Mullen, chair of the board, and I'm going to call this meeting to order. Um, Susan Barrett, do you have any comments as the executive director? No, I don't have any additional announcements, Chair Mullen. Okay, great. So the, the purpose of this afternoon's meeting is to discuss a certificate of need application for a secure residential facility. And at this point in time, I'm going to appoint Laura Bellavo as the hearing officer and turn the meeting over to her. So Laura, whenever you're ready. Yes, I'm ready. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Laura Bellavo. I am a staff attorney for the Green Mountain Care Board, and I will be serving as the hearing officer for today's hearing. It's a hearing on the application of the Vermont Department of Mental Health for a certificate of need to develop a secure residential treatment program at 26 Woodside Drive in Essex for individuals requiring residential treatment program services for mental health conditions. The docket number for this case is GMCB 002-21CON. We're holding mm -hmm. this hearing primarily remotely via Microsoft Teams. We also have a physical lo location for this hearing in compliance with the open meetings law. And that's here at our offices at 144 State Street. And this location is staffed in case someone would like to attend here. Uh, given that all the board members are par participating remotely, I'll start by making sure the board members and participants can be heard. So I will start with the board members. Uh, Mr. Chair, can you hear OK? I can, thank you. Member Holmes, can you hear me? Yes, I can, thank you. Great. Uh, Member Lunge, can you hear OK? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, Member Yusufer, can you hear OK? Hear OK? Maureen is not on this call. Oh, OK, so Maureen is not attending. Great. Correct. And Member Pelham, can you hear OK? I certainly can. Wonderful. All right. Representing the applicant today is Karen Barber, Department of Mental Health General Counsel. Uh, Ms. Barber, can you hear OK? I can. Thank you. Um, and as you mentioned uh, before we uh, started, uh, your name indication is Anna Strong because you were having uh, technical difficulties, but you are in fact Karen Barber. Yeah. Uh, uh, the health care advocate has intervened in this matter and is uh, present today. Um, uh, I believe Eric Schulteis is here. Can you hear OK? I yes, I, I can. It's going to be Mike Fisher and uh, Sam. Excellent. OK, and uh, Mike Fisher, you can hear OK? I sure can. And Sam Keish? Yep, I can. It's Pice. Tough left. Pice. Oh, Thank I'm you. sorry. Thanks. No problem. Um, excellent. And we have uh, Joanne Carson, our court reporter on the line. Um, Ms. Carson, can you hear OK? I can. Good to see you, Laura. Yeah. Thank you. You. Uh, <laughs> so as the uh, chair alluded to, normally we would have a sign in sheet documenting who's in attendance today, uh, but we can't do that remotely. Uh, but I can I have a participant list and um, I can see the people or telephone numbers of the people who are on the call. So what I'm going to do is go down the list of people I see and ask if each person I call on could please state their name and if they are here representing an organization, the name of your organization. Um, and I see um, 802-234-2505. That may be our conference line. Okay. Uh, um, I'll move on then. Uh, Joe Aja. Joe Aja with Buildings and General Services. Great. Uh, Ann Donahue. And you might be muted. Um, I'll come back. I'll come back to Ms. Donahue. Uh, uh, Susan <coughs> Barrett, who is the executive director of the Green Mountain Care Board. Elena Barabee is with the Green Mountain Care Board. Uh, and Bob, who is a guest. Bob, could you uh, tell us your full name and if you're representing an organization? Sure. Bob Beck. I'm with the Howard Center. 
Thank you. Uh, Kathy Fulton. Yes, good afternoon, Vermont Program for Quality in Healthcare. Thank you. Excellent. Um, Abigail Connolly from the Vermont Care Board. Abigail uh, is keeping us all uh, held together here, so I want to make sure she can hear okay. Yes, thank you. Excellent. Uh, Dale Hackett. Dale Hackett, independent, just here as a guest. Thank you. Uh, Devin Green. Devin Green uh, from the Vermont Association. I'm sorry, uh, could you please say that again? Devin Green from the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. Thank you very much. Elliot Rubin? Yes, I'm here. I independent Elliot Rubin, just representing myself as a guest. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Eric, we already heard from Grace Gilbert Davis. Hi, Grace Gilbert Davis, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont. Kathleen Hensi. Kathy Hensi, Department of Mental Health. Uh, and then we have uh, Ralph Irish. Hi, Ralph Irish, uh, Department of Mental Health. We have Donna from uh, Green Mountain Care Board. Donna, can you hear okay? Yes, thank you very much. Okay. Um, Kylie Kuiper. Yes, Kylie Kuiper, Office of the Healthcare Advocate. And Tabrina Karish. Tabrina Karish, Buildings and General Services. Um, I'll go back and see if Ann Donahue uh, can hear us okay. Um, okay, um, there is also, a, if anyone is having difficulty with the full Teams function, I believe there is a call-in number available as well. Um, Madam Hearing am Officer. I, am I now on? Madam Hearing Officer? Yes. Just wanted to point out that um, the way the team set up is you didn't see all the names. You have to click on the More button, Thank and there you. were several after um, uh, Tahina. So there are. Um, uh, Jennifer Acalias. Hi, from the UVM Health Network. Maureen Leahy. Maureen Leahy from UVM Medical Center Psychiatry. Jeffrey LaCourse. Uh, yeah, Department of Mental Health here as a guest today. Okay. Uh, Russ McCracken. Hi, Russ <laughs> McCracken, uh, staff attorney with the board. Erin McKenney. Hi, I'm from DMH, um, attending as a guest. Mark O'Grady. Department of Buildings and General Services. John Olson. State Office of Rural Health as a guest. I see we have Orca here. Uh, Rebecca Copans. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Vermont. Okay, and Patrick Rooney. Patrick Rooney, Green Mountain Care Board. Patricia Singer. Uh, Department of Mental Health as a guest. Um, and Anna Strong. No, that's Karen Barber. I don't know if Anna Strong is separately on the call. I am separately on. Yes, I am. Yes. Thank you very much. I'm attending for DMH. Wonderful. Uh, Susan Ridson. Yes, I'm here as a guest. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Samantha Sweet. Hi, Samantha Sweet, Department of Mental Health. Okay, Zachary Hosed. Zachary Hosed, Disability Rights Vermont. One more person um, that is uh, not, that Teams is not letting me see who it is. If I didn't call your name, could you please let me know? Lucy Garen, MMR. Thank you. Madam Hearing Officer, I wonder if you could call in. I've been in touch with Ann Donahue over text. Maybe try her one more time. Yes, certainly. Um, Ms. Donahue, can you hear me? I can hear you. That's wonderful. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, um, as as happens with this, I've asked everyone to unmute. And now if I could ask everyone, but the person who's speaking to mute back up, uh, that will make the quality of the call better for all of us. Um, I wanted to note uh, a couple notes before we begin. Um, all of the documents in the application to date are part of the record. Today's presentation and the transcript of the hearing will be added to the record. You can find the materials related to the application to date on our website. Um, now, the order of today's proceedings. Um, first, the applicant will go through a presentation. They will be sharing uh, this presentation with the board members and others participating via Microsoft Teams. Uh, copies of the presentation have been posted on the Green Mountain Care Board's website for members of the public to follow along. The easiest way to access those documents is by going to the 2021 board meeting information tab and finding the documents for today's meeting. Uh, Ms. Barber, uh, as you and uh, the other representatives of the department and uh, buildings and grounds uh, go through your presentation, um, if you could please just identify the page number of the slide you're on as you go. So if anyone who's calling into the meeting uh, instead of watching the video would be able to follow along, that would be very helpful. Um, I'll ask board members to please hold your questions until after the presentation is finished. After the presentation is finished, I will ask the applicant some questions provided by the healthcare advocate. Following that, I'll be calling on board members individually to see if they have questions. Following the board member questions, we will take public comments, uh, beginning with the in interested parties in the order of the healthcare advocate, who is an intervener in the proceeding, and representatives of the amicus organizations we have here. Um, uh, Disability Rights Vermont, I know, has a representative here. I, um, um, I'll i just ask again, in case I missed it when we went through the original roll call, if there are any representatives of Mad Freedom Inc. on the line. Okay, um, if they come, they'll be able to, if they come in late, they'll be able to join us. Um, and then following the uh, amicus organizations, it'll be other members of the public. Um, and then following public comment, we'll adjourn the hearing and turn the meeting back over to the chair. Um, so if we'll start with swearing in the, um, the representatives who are gonna make the presentation today. Um, I have the list from the PowerPoint. Is that um, an accurate list of who's going to be speaking today? Uh, yes, the only person we added was um, Mark O'Grady. From BGS. BGS, great. So um, I'm going to call on the people who are listed um, and ask you to take uh, the oath um, for so that your your testimony can be entered into the record. Um, so uh, Samantha Sweet, yeah. Anna Strong, yeah. Ralph Irish, yeah. Kathy Hensey, Sabrina Karras, yeah. Joe Aja. And Mark O'Grady? Yes. Um, please raise your right hand. All of you, um, and do you swear or affirm that the evidence you are about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ms. Barbara, I will turn it over to you to start sharing and start your presentation. And uh, Skip is going to actually share his screen uh, in the PowerPoint, so I can see my notes. Mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> Good afternoon. My name is Karen Barber, and I am General Counsel for the Vermont Department of Mental Health, or DMH. DMH, along with the Department of Buildings and Grounds, or BGS, has filed this application pursuant to the Certificate of Need statutes to build a permanent, permanent physically secure residential treatment facility in Essex to replace the current seven-bed DMH-operated Middlesex Therapeutic Community Residence. 
I will be the main presenter today, but helping me are the following staff from both DMH and BGS. There is Samantha Sweet, who is our Mental Health Services Director, Anna Strong, who's a Financial Director, Ralph Irish, who's the MTCR Program Director, and Kathy Hensey, who's our Director of Mental Health and Healthcare Integration. From BGS, we have Sabrina Karish, who's the Project Manager of this project, Joe Aja, who's the Director of Design and Construction, and Marco Grady, who's the Deputy Commissioner. This is how I plan to organize our presentation today. I'm gonna to go through the legislative history of the project, the project overview and need, design of the facility, financing, and then go through your specific criteria. Just a note, we've submitted a lot of information already to the board, both through our initial application and through our responses to five rounds of questions. There's a lot of information in this PowerPoint summarizing all of that, and I wanted to include it so it would be easier for you all to review but I plan to just highlight what DMH thinks is the most important during this presentation. Then, of course, we will be able to answer any additional or more in-depth questions. Um, and I apologize, I'm on slide four, <laughs> slide five. Um, <clears throat> this project is likely unique for most projects that come before the board because it has spent years going through the legislative process. This new facility and resulting CON are the result of years of legislative initiatives, studies, plans, and requirements to meet the needs of Vermonters and build a permanent facility, all of which included extensive stakeholder engagement surrounding need, siting, design, and programming. The planning for the design currently before the board began in earnest in 2019 when, in Act 42, the legislature allocated an FY 2020 $3 million for the replacement land acquisition design, permitting, and construction documents for the new secure residential replacement facility, slide six, and an additional 1.5 million in FY 2021, slide seven. This session, the legislature gave us the most pointed direction in Act 50. In section three, which specifically appropriated an additional $11.6 million for BGS for the secure residential recovery facility design and construction. The language went on to specify where the facility must be built, as well as including specifics about its construction and outdoor space. And in slide eight, I um, have included the entire text of the statute, <clears throat> or of the bill. Slide nine, to back up a bit, the need for an intensive secure level of care was first identified as part of the ongoing planning process to re replace the Vermont State Hospital in 2005. When Tropical Storm Irene flooded and closed the Vermont State Hospital in 2011, devastating Vermont state-run and voluntary psychiatric inpatient care capacity the state implemented this new level of care. Passage of Act 160 and Act 79 both in 2012 codified the statutory basis of a secure residential recovery facility, the resident population it would serve, and its state-run operations role. Act 79 also specifically committed to building a permanent program. Slide 10. MTCR opened in 2012. It was built using federal emergency management FEMA funds and is essentially two FEMA trailers put together. It was never meant to be a permanent solution. It is a step-down facility for those who no longer need inpatient level of care but continue to need intensive services in a secure setting. Every resident is involuntarily in the custody of the Commissioner of Mental Health and has been referred from an inpatient unit where they were placed via an order of hospitalization. While we have on average about 300 people at any one time on orders of non-hospitalization, being sent to MTCR requires a particular ONH with a judge making a specific finding that there is no less restrictive alternative than a secure setting. Slide 11. Planning for a permanent facility began soon after MTCR's opening in 2012 with Act 178 of 2014 first proposing the creation of a 14-bed replacement facility. Then in 2015, Act 26 directed DMH along with BGS to further explore siting and design considerations, as well as consider the broadest options for management and ownership. During this time, DMH posted an RFI and later an RFP and considered, considered whether there should be more than one location across the state, whether it should be state run, privately run, or partly state run and partly privately run. Slide 12. During the 2017-2018 session, the legislature passed several bills related to this facility. 
In Act 84 of 2017, they authorized BGS to purchase land. And in Acts 82 of 2017 and Act 200 of 2018, they required DMH to do a further examination of the mental health care delivery system and examine coordination across service settings. Slide 13. Act 200 of 2018 included the specific intent to replace the temporary Middlesex Secure Residential Recovery Facility with a permanent facility that has a 16-bed capacity. It also required AHS to submit a comprehensive evaluation of the mental health delivery structure. Slide 14. In January 2019, DMH presented the legislature a comprehensive report. And then again, in January 2020, we presented Vision 2030, a 10-year plan for an integrated and holistic system of care. Vision 2030 is the result of an extensive and comprehensive stakeholder engagement process conducted by DMH. Over 300 Vermonters participated in a statewide listening tour when DMH staff traveled around the state holding listening sessions. There was then a DMH think tank, which met for five full days over several months to craft strategies. The think tank had 25 members, including psychiatric survivors, family members, peers, advocates, legislators, and representatives from hospitals, DAs, and OneCare. There was also a smaller think tank advisory committee that reviewed progress and provided feedback on drafts. And finally, the draft plan was posted online for additional public comment and was specifically sent to various stakeholder groups for input, including the Adult State Program Standing Committee, the Children, Youth, and Families State Program Standing Committee, the Act 264 Advisory Board, and all listening to our participants. Slide 15. In December 2019, pursuant to Act 26, DMH submitted a report that outlined the mental health bed needs for residential programs across the state by geographic area and provider type. Specific to MTCR replacement, the report outlined the population to be served, the number of beds needed, justification for the ongoing need, and the funding request in the FY20 capital bill. Uh, slide 16. As mentioned earlier, Act 42 came out of that, which demonstrated the legislature's increased commitment to this facility by allocating to BGS $3 million in FY2020 and $1.5 million in FY21. DMH and BGS worked together with a contracted architectural firm pursuant to Act 42 to design the state-of-the-art therapeutic yet secure facility presented to you in this DOM. Building design schematics included the involvement of key stakeholders during the summer and fall of 2020, which BGS will discuss further. Uh, slide 17. This project was the focus of many hours of testimony and discussion during this last legislative session, culminating in Act 50. I think it is important to note that DMH alone testified 12 times this year and has corrections and institutions, house healthcare, Senate institutions, and Senate health and welfare just on this project. Many psychiatric survivors, peers, and advocates also testified. Uh, slide 18. Now to the project overview and need. DMH believes that in order to provide equitable care to Vermonters, a robust continuum of step-down treatment programs must be available, and a permanent secure program is a key component. 19. This program targets a small number of individuals with complex needs who cannot be served elsewhere. These are individuals whose clinical presentations and safety risks means that they cannot be served safely or therapeutically in the community at the time they are ready to discharge from an inpatient unit. The goal of MTCR and this new facility is to move people as quickly as possible out of this secure setting and into more integrated community settings. This is not a long-term facility, and residents from day one work towards discharge. DMH's goal and statutory mandate is to serve people in the least restrictive setting possible. However, at this time, there are individuals that need involuntary secure treatment, and DMH must be able to provide for those needs. Slide 20. As you can see from the photos, and as explained earlier, MTCR is two FEMA trailers put together. It was always only meant as a temporary facility and has far outlived its lifespan. The site has poor drainage and is difficult to maintain. The trailers have no permanent foundation, and frost and moisture issues require constant repair to the structure, ramps, and fencing. 21. Here is some information about the MTCR program. 
95% of referrals to the secure residence are from level one units across the state. I believe you're somewhat familiar with our system and I have a slide in a little bit that goes through it, but level one are our most acute beds. Um, the other 5% come from uh, general inpatient units. 53 individuals have been served since we opened in 2012. The average length of stay is 10.4 months. Over 64% of residents have stepped down to less restrictive settings or independent housing. And as you can see, our occupancy rates have remained very high, 22. With this new facility, DMH is seeking to build a 16-bed, physically secure recovery residence that provides the highest quality of recovery-oriented care, ensures the safety of residents, and promotes rejoining and rebuilding a life in the community. This facility will enhance equitable access to appropriate, timely, and high-quality care and treatment. 23. How did we get to 16 beds? The legislature has directed DMH to study the need for secure residential beds on multiple occasions. The last analysis we did was in 2020, the DMH Analysis of Residential Bed Needs Report. In it, we considered several factors when recommending 16 beds. The number of individuals on inpatient status with no discharge options due to acuity, meaning individuals where a secure setting was the only discharge option, and on average, there are seven to 10 individuals at any one time meeting that criteria. The number of individuals on the MTCR wait list from level one inpatient units. Currently, there are six people on the wait list, which is about average. And the number of individuals served in the community on an enhanced funding plan who would need inpatient treatment without a community-based option like MTCR. I think it is important to note that this report and the number of beds in general has been extensively testified to and debated about in the legislature. While we appreciate that not everyone agrees 16 is the right number, that is the number that was decided upon by the legislature and Act 50 specifically requires DMH and BGS to build a 16 bed facility. Slide 24. So this slide highlights the system of care bed continuum for the most acute starting on the left. I just wanna highlight that, well, this application obviously focuses on the need for secure beds as that is the project under your jurisdiction. DMH focuses on the system as a whole and does not believe all that's needed in the system is secure beds. There are a lot of gaps in the system that we continue to work on. So just quickly, we have um, 45 level one beds, which as I said, are the most acute beds over three facilities. We have 156 general beds in six facilities. Then we have our seven secure residential beds. Uh, we have enhanced uh, funding beds. We have 18 of those through programs like MyPad and Pierce House. There's 47 beds across six residences for intensive residential recovery. We have 38 mental health crisis beds across 12 facilities. We have 152 mental health group home beds across 19 facilities, 19 homes. We have transitional staff housing, and we also have 121 shelter plus care vouchers, 25. As you can see from this slide, the majority of our funding goes to community programs, not inpatient beds. And while this new residence will have an operating budget higher than what we currently pay for MTCR, it will not take away funding from any other community program, 26. Where does our $244 million in annual investments in the community mental health go? Out of that number, we currently only spend about $3 million on MTCR. The rest of the money goes to various community programs, and slide 27 provides um, an overview of those more in depth. Um, now, um, with slide 28, I'm going to turn it over to BGS uh, to talk about the design of the facility. We started the design process in March of 2020. It was a trying experience to implement a collaborative design process while navigating COVID restrictions. We quickly, excuse quickly me, learned. Excuse me. Hold on a sec. This is the court reporter. Um, first off, who is speaking? And please slow, please slow down. Okay. This is Tabrina Karish from Buildings and General Services. Thank you. So we started the design process in March of 2020. It was a trying experience to implement a collaborative design process while navigating COVID restrictions. We, qu we quickly learned to use technology to allow for a distance collaboration process. We seeked input throughout the, desi the different design phases from current MTCR staff and residents, staff at BPCH, 
the advocate community, and staff at similar sized facilities. The program goals were to enhance patient experience and healing through the design and layout. We wanted a less clinical, more residential feel. We wanted to optimize the connection with nature and natural light. Research shows that those two items have significant impact on overall well being and recovery. Slide 28. This slide shows the state's energy plan, as well as buildings and general services energy goals. We own our buildings for life. So we look at a life cycle cost to maximize our investments. We partnered with Efficiency Vermont, Green Mountain Power, and Vermont Gas to explore alternative funding opportunities, incentives to reduce the upfront cost and to achieve our energy goals. We aim to achieve energy savings above what is required by the Vermont commercial building energy standards. 29. We've conducted two site searches and considered seven total sites. None of the sites we looked at were deemed suitable for various reasons. The closing of the Woodside Juvenile Rehabilitation Center presented us with the opportunity to, to use land the state already owned. The site met all search criteria. The new facility will be located on the former Woodside site in Essex, accessed off of Route 15 in Colchester. The site is located in a popula populated area, but the natural site features provide a great deal of privacy. A steep wooded grade drops off from Route 15 to the north and east. The grade continues to drop to the south of the facility to the Winooski Valley Park. The Woodside natural area is to the west. There's a small trailhead with parking for a few cars on Woodside Drive. The wooded site and new plantings will shield the building and yard from public view. The main parking lot is to the rear of the building for a more welcoming residential feel. There are two existing buildings on the site. The main juvenile facility will be demolished. About a third of the gymnasium will be repurposed into a BGS maintenance space. The rest of the gymnasium will remain programming space. The yard features walking paths, spaces for gathering, raised garden beds, covered porches, a patio area with a gazebo, and free lawn space. Next slide. I will explain the floor plan and then we will look at some interior rendering. The building is a Y shape with the residential wings forming the arms core program space at the center, and then the administration area forms the base. We have addressed the legislative language to allow for separation of one eight bed wing from the rest of the facility with this set of fire doors. There's activity space located at the end of the wing as well as access to the yard. The yards can be separated as well. All programs shift and change over time. So we have designed as much flexibility into this facility as our budget allows. Next slide. When residents pull up to the facility, they will arrive at the drop-off area. They are greeted by the front porch. They, were, they will enter into a mudroom, an entry hall, and then drive dire arrive directly into the center of the residence. Next slide. This is a rendering of the living room. This is to the right of the entry. This room serves a variety of uses, just like a living room in your own home, reading, TV time, social time, or entertaining visitors. This is not programming space. This is a lounge space for the residents. This is a congregation area across from the living room in the main hallway, and it is outside various activity spaces. This is just an informal place to socialize or step out of an activity. This is the multi-purpose room. It's across from the main entry and the living room. This room hosts a variety of activities and is located at the center of the residence to encourage participation in these group activities. It is designed to accommodate all residents at one time. Although the room is large, the design elements and natural light make for a warm and inviting space. Next slide. This is the opposite end of the same room. There are computer stations on the far wall. The room offers excellent views to the yard. You can see the nurses stationed through the round window. Um, through the door is the dining room. Next slide. The dining room has seating for 16. 
We also have options to sit at the island in the skilled kitchen or dine outside on the covered porch. There is a door to the porch just out of view in the foreground. The skills kitchen is accessible to residents to cook their own food or have group skill building exercises. The commercial kitchen is located behind the skills kitchen. Staff will prepare all meals except for times when residents decide to prepare their own meals. The co-located kitchens also allow for collaborative meals between kitchen staff and residents. And the door you see leads to the greenhouse. The greenhouse also has access to the yard where raised beds are located to support the program. Next slide. We wanted to maximize dignity and privacy while respecting resident safety. Each bedroom has its own bathroom. The beds are a full-size bed. There are also many storage options in the desk and wardrobe. The rooms feature various seating options, including a comfortable lounge-style desk chair and a window seat. Residents can have visitors meet with staff or peer counselors without having to sit on their beds. We wanted to enhance the connection to nature through art, materials, and maximize natural light. Next slide. This slide shows the current project schedule. We are completing construction documents this week. The construction manager has begun advertisement and is preparing bid packages. We are requesting the CON be approved by August 31st. The August 31st approval date will allow site work to begin by October 1st. In addition to needing time to demolish the existing building, we have difficult soils on this site, which require the site to be preloaded. This cannot be completed when soils are frozen, so it must be done this fall before so soils freeze. If we are not able to begin this fall, construction will be delayed until soils defrost in the spring. This del delay will delay occupancy by roughly five months, as well as increase costs between 250 and 650,000 based on the construction manager's estimation of inflation. Um, now I'll um, start with, um, start back in, this is Karen Barber with um, financial expenditures. So we've submitted a lot of financial information, so I will just briefly overview them. Construction and related project costs are $21.9 million. Construction costs include new construction, renovation, site work, related expenses, and management. Related project costs include debt financing expenses, architectural engineering fees, permitting, equipment, and fixtures. I'd note that the state finances long-term capital projects with general obligation bonds, which are typically 20-year bonds. These are tax exempt, and the full faith and credit of the state are pledged to uh, the payment of the principal and interest. Next slide. <clears throat> Room and board rates for residents are established annually by the Department of Disabilities, Aging, and Independent Living, and the rate is based on the Social Security Administration cost of living guidance and rate changes. Gross resident revenue is a combination of self-pay from residents and Medicaid. Operating expenses are funded by 0.8% self-pay from residents and with federal and state funds otherwise. I note that the state pays the interest expense, not the project. The cost of debt financing and depreciation is not built into the project cost when determining revenue requirements. The cost is depicted here only for disclosure purposes. Next slide. Uh, utilization rate is based on 90% occupancy, which is consistent with the utilization of the existing facility. The residence uh, is a standalone self-contained facility operated 24-7. Uh, we anticipate needing 49 clinical FTEs to meet um, our licensure requirements and uh, an additional 14 non-clinical FTEs to support the operational and administrative needs of the facility. Next slide. Now I will quickly review all the criteria you consider when making a decision. When I, as I stated in the beginning, I believe we've provided you with most of the information you need, so I will just quickly review these. As to the first criteria, DMH adopted healthcare payment and delivery system reform in 2019, beginning a shift in community-based reimbursements to the designated agencies. Vision 2030 aims to prov provide Vermonters timely access to whole health person-led care that achieves the quadruple aims of healthcare. By fully embracing an integrated system that works collectively to address population health, wellness, and equity, Vermonters will have improved access to care, be healthier and happier, and the state will realize significant economic benefits. Next slide. We need to be able to provide the right care at the right place at the right time. 
And again, while our goal is to serve people in the least restrictive setting possible, there are a small group of individuals that continue to need a secure setting once they no longer meet hospital level of care, and we must be able to provide them that care. Without appropriate secure care, people will be forced to wait inpatient longer than necessary, the most restrictive level of care. And on the other end of the system, people will be forced to wait in EDs for beds to open up. The system depends on flow, and that depends on having various levels of care available. DMH recognizes and has testified extensively about the fact that there are lots of gaps in the mental health system of care. There is no debating yet. Yet this is not an either or situation. It is a yes and. We cannot only build on secure beds. That is just not the reality of the needs of Vermonters. The all pair model requires, requirement is to contain the cost of meeting the community need. That's not always the lowest cost option. And without these additional beds, the only option left for these individuals is remaining in inpatient beds at a much higher cost. A lack of this intensive level of service for individuals who need it is directly increasing costs that do not contribute to efficient services. We see people cycle through the system less and have better outcomes if they are served at the appropriate level of care. Um, as to your next criteria, I think, as we've already reviewed, there is a current need that isn't being met based on the, uh, the wait list for MTCR, and we know based on numerous studies, there's an additional need for beds, um, and our mandate, again, from the legislature is to build 16 beds. Uh, next criteria. This criteria is tied to the residential need study, which documented several important points about the need for this facility. The occupancy rate for group homes is extremely high. Population proposed for this project requires support and supervision that exceeds staff secure community care. And within inpatient psychiatric hospitals, there are seven to 10 individuals at any one time that need a physically secure setting. Next slide. Uh, for this criteria, Act 42 appropriated four and a half million as an initial investment in the recovery residence and this year's capital bill allocated in another 11.6 million. DMH currently has $3 million annually allocated in the budget for the operations of MTCR. The larger residents with additional treatment and service capacity, as well as additional staffing, will require additional funding to operate. And, we, and our annualized funding request to support these operating costs will be in the FY23 budget process. <clears throat> Next criteria. This project is really about assuring people have access to the appropriate level of care. And like we've said, this is the only one of its types. We believe there will be reduced costs in medical care from unnecessary days of continued hospitalization. We believe the project will positively impact wait times for hospital beds and emergency departments, for individuals waiting for services, and the availability of emergency care capacity. Timely transfer of persons to the right level of care when they need it supports the most efficient use of existing healthcare capacities and allows expenditures and charges to accurately reflect the cost of services and care delivered. Next slide. <clears throat> Next criteria. The benefits of receiving the right care at the right time and at the right place is advantageous to all members of the public. This project helps support individuals being able to move in a timely manner from a higher level of care to a less restrictive setting and supports the provision of a full spectrum of residential support options to meet the specific mental health needs of individuals. Next slide and criteria. As we've discussed, there is no real alternative to this level of care. While ideally everyone could be served voluntarily in the community and in secure settings, that is unfortunately just not the reality of Vermont cases today. We are talking about really complex cases with very real public safety concerns. Failed community placements do not support individuals on their path to recovery and lead individuals to being bounced around and living in an emergency department. It is also important to note that no one goes to this facility without a court order after receiving due process and having been appointed an attorney to Vermont Legal Aid's mental health law project. Next criteria, or well, second part. Um, in terms of location, BGS did a lot of work to find this location, as you heard. Uh, the legislature heard testimony on it and specifically required us to build there. Next slide and criteria. Um, I think we've answered in our um, application and some questions about energy efficiency, but this slide just highlights some examples. Uh, next criteria. Um, again, I think we've reviewed extensively the need, um, and I've, again, included that language about, from the legislature requiring us to build this facility. 
Uh, next criteria. Uh, for those who need this level of care, it is the only facility in Vermont available. It will greatly improve access by over doubling its bed capacity. As you can see from the pictures and some more information to come about programming, the quality of care will far surpass what is currently available. And for all Vermonters, this will greatly help with the flow in the system for those seeking mental health care treatment, as well as those that need to access the ED for other reasons. Next slide and criteria. The recovery resident has a unique mission and program with licensure as a therapeutic community resident. Its purpose was, designed, was defined in Act 79, and the ongoing need for a permanent replacement has been the subject of acts and reporting requirements to the legislature for the past several years. MTCR serves an otherwise unmet need, and DMH has not found an alternative willing entity to develop a comparable program. To date, DMH remains the only entity adequately fulfilling Act 79's statutory obligation to assure this level of care is available. There will not be any adverse impacts to existing services provided by DMH or any of our other providers. DMH has the necessary experience and bandwidth to run this new facility, will have all necessary funding, and is in a good position to recruit staff. Uh, next criteria. Um, this is a much easier location to access than the current facility. It is just off the interstate and it is very close to a bus route. Next criteria. Um, this does not involve the purchase of new health technology. It was not cost efficient given the size of the facility and the current MTCR operates without an EHR. Uh, next criteria. Uh, this facility will operate as a statewide resource for this level of care affording equal access to individuals regardless of ability to pay. Resident care will be delivered in an integrated and holistic manner based on evidence-based practices. It will be licensed as a therapeutic community resident and be subject to all applicable inspections and regulatory standards. Residents in this program will have access to and oversight by Disabilities Rights Vermont in its capacity as the state mental health care ombudsman, as well as legal representation by the uh, Vermont Legal Aid Mental Health Law Project. Next criteria. This facility as proposed purports the HRAP principles. It meets a, a critical health need for those in need of this level of care. No other provider in Vermont provides this level of care. Next slide. In terms of cost containment, the lack of sufficient beds for people who need this level of care creates a cascade of costs throughout the system, as those in need and care wait in hospitals, and those in need of hospital care wait in emergency rooms. In addition, when an acute mental health need goes undressed and untreated, the person's condition may decline, leading to a longer and perhaps more challenging recovery period. The quality of care environment in the new facility will far surpass what has been available and what was envisioned to be a temporary facility and program. In terms of payment and delivery reform, DMH fully embraces the quadruple aim and has recently convened the Mental Health Integration Council in concert with a legislative charge to integrate health systems in Vermont. This facility has been developed as a critical service in the vision of a fully integrated, equitable, and responsive healthcare system. Next criteria. Um, as we said, there are no other services like this new residential. No one will be denied service based on the ability to pay, and no one would be denied services based on any other reasons such as race, gender, sexual orientation, or age. Next slide. Next criteria. The Vermont Blueprint for Health designs community-led strategies for improving health and well-being, and the DMH recovery residents will play a key role in that work. While the recovery residents will be a clinical treatment residence, it will also focus heavily on providing non-clinical interventions and activities. The program is focused on building a culture of care that not only treats those seeking care with respect and dignity, but supports them in leading the development of their treatment plans and recovery goals. And there will be a strong connection to community providers. Next criteria. The vision for this facility is to provide integration and coordination of healthcare services in a holistic manner addressing mental health, physical health, and substance use. Next slide. For mental health, we will have evidence-based practices, connections with community mental health providers, and a robust staff. In addition, we will offer, sorry, next slide, um, medication management, therapy, groups, life skills, leisure skills, health and wellness, and peer support. Next slide. For physical health, we'll have 24-7 on-site nursing, yearly physical, connections to community PCPs, 
connections to community health centers, dental and vision care, and nurse-led groups. Next slide. For substance use treatment, we'll have in-house therapists and psychologists, integrated treatment plans and assessments, access to community treatment and groups, and in-house groups on co-occurring treatment. Uh, next slide and next criteria. The DMH recovery residents would significantly enhance Vermont's progress on healthcare reform. We would provide the appropriate care in a timely manner, improve patient experience, improve provider experience, help improve community connections, help community meet needs identified in the community health needs assessments, and contain costs. Next criteria uh, isn't applicable given it's not an emergency CON or connected to a hospital, but I would just note again that we've been planning for this facility since Tropical Storm uh, first um, closed the Vermont State Hospital and we opened MCCR in 2012. And then for the last criteria, um, you know, again, no one will be denied services based on ability to pay. No one will be denied services based on race, gender, sexual orientation, or age. And the service is statewide. And now we're available for questions. Thank you. Um, I will, the first thing we'll do is I will uh, read the questions from the healthcare advocate. Um, and after you respond to those, um, we'll open it up to the board. Madam Hearing Officer, can I ask a question? Yes. I, I just wonder if it makes sense for the advocate's office to get to ask our, to frame our questions and, and ask our questions. I understand your interest in facilitating a fast meeting, but we won't need to speak in the public comment time if we get to ask our questions. Uh, that sounds reasonable, sure. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, so I, I, I have a very brief introduction and then Sam's gonna ask the, the three questions that, that we framed uh, earlier. Um, we really just wanted to, uh, it's, I think it's important for me to say that uh, our interest here uh, is to make sure that there is a good public meeting um, I appreciate that the um, that the uh, applicant has it feels like they've done many many meetings on this, but uh, nonetheless, at this stage of a decision, it makes sense to us that that there be a meeting like this, as is always the case for the Green Mountain Care Board, uh, the practice for the Green Mountain Care Board. So um, I appreciate having this opportunity. And and then the other thing that I wanted to say is a full recognition that the HCA's office is not the expert here. Uh, we are really here in support of making sure that um, that all voices are heard. Uh, and so we while we do have a few questions, I, I think you know my my full weight goes behind the questions from the members of the public as well. So that's my framing. Um, Sam, why don't you go ahead and ask the questions? Thanks, Mike. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Just as a reintroduction, my name is Sam Peisch. I'm a health policy analyst with the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. I just want to thank the Madam Hearing Officer, members of the board, and the staff for the opportunity to ask questions, and thank also to DMH for the presentation. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead with my first question. Could you please explain your analysis for the current lack of community health capacity and how this new facility contributes to the system of care in Vermont? Uh, sure. So, and I, I think we've somewhat answered this, but I could kind of review it again. So, um, as I said, you know, the legislature has directed DMH to study the need for community mental health capacity, specifically secure residential beds on multiple occasions. Um, and as I reviewed previously, Act 82 of 2017 and Act 200 of 2018 were bills that required DMH to undertake in-depth examinations of the mental health care delivery system and coordination across service settings. I also spoke at length about Vision 2030 and how much work went into examining the mental health needs of Vermont. In terms of this type of bed, as I said, the last analysis we did was in 2020 um, with the residential bed needs report. Um, we considered several factors in coming to um, the number 16. Um, as I mentioned before, and I think it's important to note again that you know the report and the, and the number of beds was really debated about quite a bit in the legislature. Um, and again, while we appreciate maybe not everyone agrees that 16 is the right number, it is the number that came out of the legislative process, and it, and it is the number that CMH and BGS are required. 
to build. Um, and again, I'd note that while this application focuses on secure beds because that's what's in front of the board today, there are many other gaps in the system and we realize that and we are working on them. And as you've seen from the legislative history, we've been required to do many studies on that. Um, and we remain focused on the entire system of care, even though this itself was just focused on secure beds. Thank you. Um, so the second question is, to what extent is the funding model based on residents consistently filling beds? How do you ensure that there's no financial motivation to fill beds? Sure. So the funding model is not based on residents consistently filling beds. The funding is primarily paid by federal 56% and state 44% dollars. Federal medical assistance percentages and state Medicaid support the operation needs and expenditures of the facility regardless of the number of residents. Resident self-pay by individuals or their insurer is only 0.77% of revenue supporting operating costs. In addition, MCCR is the last, last residential facility to be considered as a discharge option, and there are three layers in place to assure referrals are appropriate. First, inpatient hospitals are the ones that are making the referrals to MCCR based on the individual's acuity, dangerous behavior, or criminal charges. DMH's care management team reviews every referral for appropriateness to the program. And third, no one is actually accepted or sent to the program without a court order in the form of a specific ONH with the court finding no less restrictive alternative is appropriate for the individual. Thank you. Third question is- Can I just how jump this, in and, and yep. uh, just say that for us non-lawyers, if you could explain what an, what an ONH is, Apologies. Yes. Sorry. That's the order of non-hospitalization. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, third question is, how does this facility align with Vermont's community health goals and the all-payer model? Sure. So I think we have touched on this too, so I hope it's not too much repeat. Um, but the project is committed to improving the quality of mental health care of Vermonters. We want individuals to receive the right care at the right place at the right time. We don't want anyone staying inpatient longer than they need to be there, nor do we want to see people waiting in EDs. Population health depends on a fully articulated system of care that provides ready access to appropriate care, and our ultimate goal is to serve the individual in the most exclusive and least restrictive place possible. We know that based on the data, we do need a secure and safe place for some individuals to step down to, and this state-of-the-art therapeutic community will have a holistic approach to healthcare and integration. This facility will also greatly reduce the bottleneck that occurs as hospitalized individuals are ready to transition to a lower level of care, but frequently wait to be accepted, leaving those currently needing inpatient treatment to wait in emergency rooms for a hospital bed to open. In this way, this facility is a keystone in the mental health system of care continuum, critical to ensuring Vermonters can access the care they need when they need it. And as to the all-pair model, I think, I, you know, I touched on these before, but it's really about containing the cost of meeting community need. Data supports the fact that on any given need, there is capacity in the community that does not meet the needs of individuals presenting, both for admission and discharge. Again, cost containment doesn't necessarily mean cho choosing the lowest care option, the lowest cost option. And without this level of care, the only option left is inpatient care, which is a much higher cost. Um, this facility will increase bed capacity, allowing for more movement through the inpatient system of care. And by allowing Vermonters to step down to a facility when their level of care needs it, it makes room for others to access that level of care. We believe that this lack of intensive level of service for patients who need it is directly increasing costs that do not contribute to efficient services. Thank you. Um, Madam Hearing Officer, I was wondering if it would be possible to ask one clarification question um, in addition, just based on the slides that were presented. Uh, yes, that's fine. Thank you. Um, so last question, thank you for the time. Um, I didn't see in the slide on trainings. I saw a couple of things about um, trauma-informed care, and I didn't see any trainings about cultural competency, language access, ESL, or implicit bias, trainings that are a little more in the realm of anti-racism and access, health equity. So I'm wondering if there are any trainings like that also planned for staff and administrators at the facility. Thanks. Um, who wants to talk? Okay. You want me to go ahead? I'll, I'll have Sam do it. I'll give that to Sam's feet. Um, 
So here at DMH, we actually have an anti-racism uh, work group going on. And uh, we have also done uh, trainings at Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital, as well as implementing some trainings at, at MTCR. And so we are also partnering with um, Vermont, oh, I'm gonna, uh, for the deaf and hard of hearing to uh, bring in more trainings and more therapists as well. Um, so we are in the process of developing more trainings for our staff. And that will be a, definitely part of the new program. Thank you. Those are my mm -hmm. questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and now we can uh, move on to uh, questions from our board members. Um, uh, board member Lunch, would you like to go first? Yes, can, am I unmuted? You can hear me okay? I can hear you fine. Great, thank you. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. I appreciated that as well as the written materials. Um, I do have a few questions. Um, in terms of the connection to the all pair model, the all pair model has three overarching goals um, and three high level population health measures, which include increasing access to primary care, reducing deaths due to suicide and um, drug overdose, and then uh, working on the reducing the incidence and morbidity of certain chronic diseases. Could you please tie your application to those three population health goals? Yes. Um, Kathy, is that something you want to take? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Robin. This is Kathy Hensley, Department of Mental Health. Hi, um, Kathy. Good to see you. Uh, it's nice to see you. So, um, the uh, with the, can you just list the three for me again, Robin? The three that Absolutely. you mentioned. Absolutely. Uh, increase access to, and again, it may not meet all of them, but these are kind of our three high level goals that are our guiding light on population health. So, increasing access to primary care. Reducing deaths due to suicide or drug overdose, and then improving um, either the incidence or morbidity of common uh, chronic diseases like heart disease, diabetes, the, the ones you would suspect. Yeah, thank you. So um, these are actually fundamental uh, pieces in the new programming for the secure recovery residents. It's very much uh, founded in principles of holistic care. Um, the, each resident at the facility on their team, um, they will not only have a peer representative, they will have their local um, CRT director, the uh, community rehabilitation and treatment manager from the local DA to work with them. And all of that is driving toward connection back into the community services. And each resident will have an annual exam with the PCP, with the local PCP will be connected with a local community health center. Um, they're, they're strong. The way that the, um, when you saw the design of the building and Trevina talked about the outside and it's very much designed to facilitate activities, exercise, um, to facilitate a, a much more holistic approach to health. Um, the, in addition, um, you mentioned suicide and drug overdose. Uh, DMH is deeply invested in the zero suicide uh, work that we're leading throughout the state. And uh, this, the, we are working very strongly with uh, primary care providers across the state, bringing that into primary care um, for suicide prevention. Um, and the trainings are throughout with all providers, not just primary care, but um, to address and are, be able to recognize suicidality. Um, drug overdose, the another piece of the um, of the program, the treatment program at the facility is to be very uh, connected in with substance use treatment and services. 
And again, the, the whole connection with the DAs, where we, this will be very uh, woven in with DA services and working to support those to make sure it's a very intensive um, program to ensure that as um, there, it's something like um, more than 54% of current residents at MTCR have transitioned back into the community. And the, the whole push is for recovery. So there's a very intensive focus on getting people connected in the community um, to services like substance use, if that's needed. The whole uh, comorbidity is a, is a primary focus. And in part of this too, is that the treatment plans, um, every effort will be made that residents are very involved in their own, creating their own treatment plans, that ownership is a, is a big piece in recovery and success in recovery. The individual um, morbidity, chronic disease, heart disease, again, that goes back to this very strong connection with local community health um, and the focus in the programs um, within the facility itself. And then the, with the transition, um, working with people as they transition back into the community to keep them connected into those services to, to support holistic health, not just mental health. And I would just note that the zero suicide framework promotes a robust continuum of step down treatment programs to, um, <clears throat> to assure there's continuity of care across, um, across all levels of care. And we believe that this is an important part of that uh, continuum of care. Thank you. Um, I had a question about the private pay model, recognizing that it's a very, very small amount of the revenue, but what, how does private pay, what is, how does that work? Like, is it a day, day rate? Is it a, you know, is it fee for service? Could you just please describe that? Yes, I'm going to turn that over to Anna. Hello, this is Anna Strong, financial director for the Department of Mental Health. Hi, and Anna. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm, hello there. I'm off camera. <laughs> I don't have good camera connection. However, the payer model annually, the Department of Aging and Independent Living establishes a rate based on the Social Security Administration's guidance for cost of living allocation. So it shifts what an individual or resident who receives Social Security Administration benefits, which is a, quite a few of the population, um, more than half of the population receives these benefits. And they are billed a per diem rate based on ability to pay. So the Social Security Administration allows people to keep a, a considerate portion of their what they receive, depending on their benefit amount and need. So a resident is billed a per diem rate well they, they are a resident, or when they step down into continuing care after they're discharged from the facility. Okay. I really... I, I wish that um, I had brought one of my colleagues with me who does this direct billing. However, <laughs> the way that that works is a monthly letter is written to the resident. Most residents have a payee. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, Skip Irish, who's the head of the residential facility. And we work with the payee to determine the individual's needs. Most individuals at the facility do not actually end up needing to pay anything to state it. Some of the residents have, are eligible for insurance through the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare um, right, CMS coverage. And so their insurance can be billed and staff at the existing residential work with them to put all that together is often in concert with their payee, or the resident is charged a small reasonable fee that allows them to also keep a living, a living amount for themselves. Some residents maintain, of course, a home or apartment or a life outside of um, their residential stay that they will return to. So in consideration of all of that, it's a sliding scale fee and it is established by the Social Security Administration. 
and depending and, on a resident. Yeah, is, is that enough information for you? Yeah, I mean, as long so it's I is the sliding scale fee that's set according to Social Security Administration benefits apply even if the person doesn't have Social Security benefits, so they're not on SSI mm -hmm. or receiving Social Security disability? Yeah, I mean, maybe that doesn't asking. happen. Maybe there aren't patients in that situation. I'm just trying to understand sort of the range. No, Robin, you are correct. I'm, I'm, I thank you for bringing that up. There are residents who do not fall into those categories. Most residents do, like oh, well over 95% do. However, those who do not, for different reasons, um, they what happens internally at the Department of Mental Health is that we have a form that is filled out by the resident, often their payee, often the support staff at the facility, that determines basically their debt to income ratio. So if someone has no income, they are not charged for their yep. stay. Got it. That is when, yeah, that is when the state and federal programs, you know, cover the cost of their of their stay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That was helpful to have a better understanding of how that works. Um, so I did have a follow up question on the ability to segregate both halves of the facility and the legislated legislative requirement. And it sounded from um, it seemed like from the testimony today that there were fire doors that could be closed in order to ensure that the serenity room and the laundry were available for that other half of the facility, which were concerns raised by Representative Donahue in one of her public comments. Could you confirm that or explain that to me a little better? Sure. Yeah, I'll just give a little background. So this did come up during session when the plans were presented to the legislature. There was discussion about whether or not it could be used to separate. There was discussion about whether or not we should redesign the entire facility to make this happen. If you look at the actual legislation, it says through interior fit up versus building design, the 16 bed facility shall include two eight bed wings designed with the capacity to allow for separation of one wing from the main section of the facility if necessary. Both wings shall be served by common clinical and activity spaces. So, that is what was done. There is a fire door. We didn't redesign it because the legislature didn't want us to do that because we told them how much it was going to cost. As you saw during Sabrina's presentation, we can pull that slide up again if you want. There are fire doors that mean that it can be separated. The laundry is just outside. The legislation doesn't require the laundry be inside. It requires um, common clinical and activity spaces, which is contained within the wing. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Um, and then there was also, I also wanted some clarifications about the outdoor space. And in the answers to our questions, you did list the gazebo and the raised garden beds. Those are, are within the current budget that you've submitted. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So the, the areas that you, as you've described them, are um, won't need additional appropriation or uh, anything like that for the amenities in the outdoor space. No, just confirming with BGS. Yeah. No. No one camera. <laughs> I can Great. Me shake my head. <laughs> okay. Um, and then I did have one last question about the um, electronic health record and what you what you looked at in terms of the affordability. And uh, specifically, I was wondering if you considered sharing an EHR with either uh, the Berlin facility or with uh, several of the designated agencies, it's my understanding that they share a common EHR uh, because certainly having some sort of electronic ability to communicate will improve your community integration and the ability of primary care and others to understand the treatment. Um, so could you speak to that a little bit? Yes. I'm trying to find where we answered it. Um, so these were discussions that occurred. As you may know, there was a complete leadership transition at TMH um, when we began this project to where we are at now, um, including everyone who worked on this project. Um, so, but I know that this, let me find my notes. I know it was considered. Um, I, can, I, can, I have it tabbed, so I can tell you okay. where, what you said. 
Um, so I know they did look at that, and I think where the cost prohibitive piece came in when we were talking to ADS about it was trying to build firewalls. So say we tried to use uh, VPCHs, I think what we were finding was it was going to be cost prohibitive to try to create those firewalls to separate it. Um, the same with trying to hook up with something like UVM or the designated agencies, but I think it was that piece of it, that firewall piece, um, that was really the... the um, what was really pushing the cost over the edge in terms of what um, made it feasible. And yes, I, I think that we'll continue. You know, at this point, we have an EHR VPCH. If we put it out for bid again at one point, we would consider also putting out this new facility with it to see what it looks like. Um, right now, that's just not in the plans. I think in addition, you know, if you want Skip to talk about it, they do have, you know, kind of a robust system that's working for them. And I think we could, you know, kind of walk you through that if you want. Um, but it is certainly something that was considered and that will keep on the horizon if we put the um, the hospitals out to bid again. Yeah, and that would be great to just walk us through a little bit how that care coordination will happen um, absent electronic resources. Sure. So when you say care coordination, are you talking about within the facility? I'm thinking about, um, you know, one of the uh, one of the areas that you've mentioned is patients being able to get a, a annual visit if they need follow up visits, for example, that, you know, the primary care office has an EHR. And so having, you know, that's kind of how providers are starting to uh, understand the full picture for a patient. So how will you ensure that providers outside of the facility will have full information related to the patient and vice versa? How will that information flow absent uh, electronic uh, means? Excuse me, this is the core reporter. Who's answering, going to answer this question? So Who's this in the background? This is Ralph Irish. So I can't hear you, who, who is it? Ralph. Ralph Irish. Thank you. So currently we are um, using paper and we're um, bringing um, that information with us to all appointments and then bringing the information back and um, disseminating it um, to staff and um, putting it in their, in their paper charts. Um, I, I don't know if we had an, in the EHR if it would be connected in that way anyway so that outside providers would be able to access it. I think that is kind of some of the problems with the firewalls that um, are, are currently the issue with getting a, um, set up on someone else's um, EHRs is, is them having access to other information that um, they shouldn't have access to in someone's chart. So I, I think even if we have our own EHR in in house. Um, it's not going to it's not going to be shared uh, through electronic means like that with other facilities. Yeah, I believe that is not something that occurs at VPCH. I think because of the there's with twenty four CS and that they we have a unique. Yeah. Yeah. Although patients can provide permission to have that sharing happen under federal law. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's just not automatically, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, that's it for my questions. Great, uh, board member Pelham, do you have any questions? I do, I was waiting for you to call on Jess in the alphabetical order, but uh, I'm good to go here. Um, so thank you very much for a very intense presentation and uh, for all of you that have stuck with this for a number of years now, uh, just the perseverance is uh, uh, amazing. It's uh, for me, it's causing a little bit of uh, deja vu because when I was finance commissioner, we were closing the Brandon training school and downsizing the state hospital to 50 beds. And so the process of moving all that money out into community-based services was uh, <laughs> an extraordinary task now that I think about it. Um, but it was not, it's not me, it was mostly Con Hogan and his folks um, did a great job. So my first question here um, just has to do with benchmarking construction costs for facilities like this. 
And so I'm I'm looking at your $16 million in construction and the additional now bringing the total project cost up to $21 million. And just wondering, are there, uh, has any research been done or are there any benchmarks as to whether or not those that per bed cost on the total project cost at $21 million, it's, uh, you know, uh, $1.3 million a bed. Um, is there is there any point of reference for for what what the, this proposal is relative to what happens in other states or uh, other facilities of of this nature? Sure. Joe Aja for BGS. Uh, in our history of building facilities similar to this, but a slight, uh, for slightly different, uh, and having our contractors present estimates. This is where we get our data from for that. And we have looked at other facilities in past years for other projects in other states, and it's on board with roughly the same cost. A lot of the cost can differ because of the different sites that are proposed and where we construct. So in, in this in this situation, you don't have any land costs. We all the state already owns the property. And part of the building, I think the gym is going to be retained and used. And I just, uh, you know, there's one way of developing project costs just by having a wish list and then people pay for it. But it also helps to have some uh, benchmarking relative to what the market is out there. And if you do have any information in that regard, I'd, I'd be interested in seeing it. it uh, this this is an extraordinary thing to think about about 1.3 million dollars a bed and it, it, it's a lot of money if if you have it if you don't you don't um, I'm also interested in the operating cost the nine million dollars plus or minus and wondering if that fits in with the global commitment cap um, a couple of years ago uh, there was constraints on our budget at the Green Mountain Care Board because people were worried about breaching this global commitment cap. And this is a fairly significant increase, I would think, going from uh, 3 million, uh, which is what the current uh, project is for the Middlesex project, and to 9 million. So are there any concerns or discussions about uh, breaching uh, the global commitment cap that might affect other people, other entities that are reliant on global commitment? Sure, I'm gonna hand that one over to Anna Strong. Hello there. This is Anna Strong from the DNH Business Office. This has been a point of discussion with the AHS Central Office. We do have we do have a waiver with CMS, an agreement that exists, and it's always sort of a, a moving object being processed as it goes. And I'm going to for now call it a good faith discussion <laughs> that in the requirement and need to create a more robust residential facility, we do have full approval for this annual budget amount. And I would be more than happy to provide you with some backup documentation for that. That's not a problem. So prospectively for 2023, the agency would say that this project fits on an operating basis within the global commitment budget and yeah, and yeah. could and could tell us whether or not that was achieved by constraining some other or that it's it's just just allowed within the global commitment money. Um, that can absolutely be confirmed. I believe when it became a part of the capital bill, it was wholly embraced and accepted by the agency of human services as yeah. part of the budget going forward i believe without an adjustment to another entity but i would mm -hmm. love to confirm that yeah. for your peace of mind and my own okay well capital the capital end of this isn't wouldn't be funded i don't think by global commitment um so no. i'm just i'm just okay. talking about the op the operating budget it's it's a, it's a big big jump and just wondering if there was any downside impacts of of this big jump. Um, my next question was uh, that chart, you don't have to go to it, but it was the one that kind of showed the stairs uh, associated with a system of care in terms of bed continuum. And so at the at the 
at, at the upper end were your level one facilities. And then the next step down were hospital beds. And then the next step down was the secure residential, this project. And I'm just wondering, um, so the two above it certainly would be considered institutional facilities. And and I think uh, Representative Donnie, who has made this point, this one is being um, uh, described as a community facility. I'm just wondering, is are, are those designations some kind of a formal process or could this facility also be designated as a an institutional facility? Um, well, I think when you're when you're generally talking institutions, right, you're talking like a hospital. So there is a difference in licensure. So MTCR is licensed as a therapeutic community residence. Um, and it will continue. It's mandated by Act 79 to be licensed as a community residence. It will continue its, its licensure as a community residence. So it meets all of those standards. Um, and it is a community residence. It's always been considered a community residence by the legislature. Um, it is very different from a hospital level of care. Hospitals obviously are licensed differently, have a lot more requirements, um, are CMS, CMS certified and a Joint Commission accredited. Um, none of that applies to the secure residential. It, as again, it really is a residential facility. It's licensed as such. Um, we um, have never considered it that way. We've always considered it a residential program. That's always been the way it's been referred to by the legislature. Um, and always been our mandate is to build this as part of our continuum of care in the community. So redesignating this, um, I mean, I understood the point that uh, Representative Donahue was making um, in terms of this going into some kind of base uh, division of community investments in community uh, facilities versus institutional ones. Uh, but it sounds like this is pretty well dug in as a community facility. That's what I'm hearing yeah. you say. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> let's see. I think my last question is. Um, just kind of looking at the pipeline again and, and the tension, this ongoing tension between community facilities and institutional facilities, what if if what would you say was the last major investment that the state made in the community based services outside of this project? Um, and what is what is the next investment that the department agency is thinking about? in terms of investing uh, in the improvement of community-based facilities. Sam, is that something you want to take? Oh, let me see. I'm going to look to Anna for financially how much. I know this is Samantha Sweet, sorry, from DMH. Um, I know there was a large rate increase into our DA system. We've also been working on um, embedded mental health clinicians with law enforcement. Um, that is something that we are trying for almost over the threshold with implementing that, um, as well as uh, I believe we're using some COVID dollars to have uh, a case manager within each one of the agencies to provide support to those that have been affected by COVID-19. Um, we are continuously looking at other ways to um, increase capacity within our communities and um, within our DA system. Uh, we work strongly with not only our DAs, but Pathways Vermont uh, regarding housing. And we have continuously increased the number of Shelter Plus care vouchers that we have in our system. Over the years, it has grown um, by quite a bit each year. Um, those are some big ones that I can think of off the top of my head, and uh, but I am sure that there are others. Well, thank you for that. One uh, last quick question is that there was a reference in the material to 12 beds at Brattleboro Retreat um, that I thought what I took away from that was that they are available and up and running, but because of the problems at the retreat, they're not accessible. So do you have any insight as to whether or not 
there is a is, is a game plan to add those 12 beds? Do you want me to take that? Yes. Okay. So this is Samantha Sweet again from DMH. Yes. Uh, Brattleboro Retreat is uh, ready to open the doors for the 12 new level one beds. Um, however, they're not able to due to staffing. They're not able to uh, retain staff or uh, hired nurses in that area. Um, issue for them to to bring traveling nurses into the area. So we're we're actively working on um, of, of bringing people into uh, that area and what can be done for housing. Are they able to use other uh, buildings on their campus to for housing or hotels in the area? And so we're constantly looking at how can we increase our staffing in order to get more inpatient beds online. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, next, we'll go to board member Holmes. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you again for, as others have pointed out, all the important work and the long work that's been gone into this application and all the stakeholder engagement you've done. Um, let me just actually, many of my questions have been asked by my fellow board members. So thank you to my fellow board members for, for that. Uh, let me actually start with a question that you just finished up answering around um, or mentioning was the staffing challenges that the Brattleboro Retreat is facing and some public comments and other comments have referenced, you know, concerns about um, staffing, whether this is going to be indeed able to be staffed with the increased capacity. Can you speak a little bit to somebody speak a little bit to that and how you might overcome that obstacle? Uh, yes, I can speak to that. This is Karen Barber. Um, so the current staff at MCCR would account for nearly half of the staff that we would need at this new facility. Um, as for recruiting new staff, we have several plans to support our additional staffing needs. One of the factors supporting this chosen site was its location in the largest population center of Vermont. Um, in addition to the normal recruiting practices of the state, we plan to engage local undergraduate and graduate programs to try to recruit staff and interns to create a steady go of potential ongoing staff. Uh, we already have contracts with numerous traveling companies that provide, uh, currently provide staff for BPCH and MTCR, uh, the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital BPCH. Um, and can, we'll continue to utilize those to fill gaps in our staffing. Those contracts also do allow us, they're not just for nurses, we also can um, get mental health specialists through those contracts. Sorry, uh, I'm sorry, this is Lauren Porter again. You're going too fast, I can't understand what you're saying. I apologize. Where do you want me to start? We already have contracts with numerous traveling companies. Yes, um, that we currently used at BBCH and MTCR, so we continue, continue to utilize those. Those are not just for nurses, those are also for mental health specialists, which those are the bulk of our staff at our facility are those mental health specialists. Um, so if we cannot get enough permanent state employees, we could uh, utilize those contracts for that. We do generally have enough uh, mental health specialists at our facilities. It's more nurses that we uh, struggle with. I think as Sam talked a little bit about in terms of housing, it's a big uh, priority of the Agency of Human Services right now to figure out how we're going to provide housing for traveling nurses. Um, you know, I know we're working right now to contract with a hotel in Williston to try to get some nurses in at VPCH. So we're thinking really creatively. And by the time this opens, I feel confident that we'll have a housing um, plan. In addition, regarding the advanced degree professional staff, um, you know, given we're in the Burlington area, we feel like working with the um, undergraduate and graduate programs will be able to recruit staff. And as for psychiatry, uh, we anticipate expanding our current contract with UVMMC. Uh, UVM provides psychiatry for both um, BPCH and MTCR currently. Great. Um, so I know that MTCR, you know, currently operates at seven beds at 90% capacity. Um, and there's a wait list. I also understand all the work that went into, you know, determining that 16 beds was the appropriate need. I guess my question is, if you find that the facility is under capacity or not being utilized to its full 16 bed capacity, 
which frankly, there's a part of me that hopes that's the case, right? Because that means there's less of this acute need, right? But um, if it turns out that there is some slack there, what are the plans for using those beds? How how could you you know pivot and use that maybe one of the wings? What would you use it for? How do you maximize the use of these beds and ensure that this is efficient use of of space? And what's the plan B? <laughs> Um, well, I think that's not an easy question to answer, right, because I don't know two years down the road when this opens or a year and a half what the needs are going to look like and what populations we may need to serve. I think one of the other things we need to be careful about is funding. Um, so we need to be, right now this is a Medicaid-funded hospital, right, so we need to be careful not to try to use it as a forensic wing, right, because that would impact um, our ability to use Medicaid funding if we were trying to use it purely for like a forensic facility. Um, you know, obviously there are some Jerry psych issues that we're constantly struggling with and, and where do we place folks that are needed nursing home level of care and also have complex mental health needs. So I think it would really be an analysis that we would be required to do by the legislature because, you know, they're the ones that have required us to, to build this. And it would be really a conversation with the legislature. I'm sure there would be reports and analysis um, and then presentations to the legislature about what would make sense. Um, and then really taking their lead and determining what they wanted us to use the facility for, um, because again, they would need to allocate the funding for it. So we would really, it would be working in concert with the legislature depending on the needs at the time. Okay. Um, and I guess my only other question really is, uh, in the presentation in the application, it referenced, I think 64% of residents successfully transitioned to the community. I'm wondering if you can speak about what happens to the other 36% sure. of residents. I'm going to hand that over to Sam Hi, this is Samantha. So, um, unfortunately, we have, um, I would say, a large majority of the other percentage uh, are returned to inpatient units, um, whether they stop taking medications, um, there's an act of violence, uh, or um, they uh, or they return to the community, but that's not in a really successful way. Um, they have been able to um, uh, leave the discharge from the facility AMA. Uh, but I would say a large majority of those are returned to the hospital um, for further treatment. Okay, and, and that's because the need there is acute enough to be in an inpatient setting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, I think, honestly, I think most of my questions were asked and answered already by others, so thank you. Wonderful, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, Karen, um, in your presentation, you talked about the fact that ideally um, this care would be in a community setting. And you said, unfortunately, we don't have that infrastructure in place. Does the department have an analysis by um, geography of, of where the shortcomings are? Uh, you mean where residents are primarily coming from? Well, which communities are not meeting the needs of being able to um, provide um, behavioral health on, in a local setting, just like they would their physical health? Oh, I think what I meant was there is, <clears throat> there is ideally, right, everyone receives services in the community on a voluntary basis. And what I meant was that we're not at a part, we're not at a place um, where people are, that, that everyone is capable of doing that, right? Like the, right now we just do have a small segment of the population that requires involuntary secure care that just can't be provided in the community because their needs are so high. Ideally, no one needs that level of care. Um, and so, you know, I think we talk a lot about, um, you know, prevention and working on child mental health and all of those things to try to support people. Um, and so that's what I meant was that we just, unfortunately, we don't live in a society right now where there's no, there's no one that is, there's no involuntary care. 
Um, and that's the goal, right? The goal is a, a purely voluntary, non-coercive system of mental health. That's just, that just doesn't exist right now. And so DMH has to build for the reality, which is the fact that there are folks that continually get put in our custody by the court system to receive secure care. That's what I meant by that. Does that make sense? Yep. So right now, if you don't have capacity, what happens to that person that uh, the court has deemed uh, to be in, in uh, under your custody? They remain in a hospital bed until um, a bed at MTCR opens. So oftentimes in, in emergency departments, right? Well, so everyone coming to MTCR is coming out of an, uh, an inpatient unit. Um, so they're actually waiting in an inpatient bed. But what that means is that there are people waiting in the ED for their bed. Um, and that really they're ready to transition to a lower level of care, but we can't put them in NCCR because there's not, you know, there's not room. So they wait in an inpatient bed and then someone in the ED is waiting. So there's a triage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Um, you talked about the stakeholder engagement and the think tank. Can you, can you expound upon that and who was involved in this and it, it was there consensus because Based on the public comments, there seems to be a lot of uh, disagreement about whether or not this is the uh, right uh, proposal at this time. Um, I, you know, to be honest with you, I'm not sure that the Department of Mental Health ever gets consensus, complete consensus on anything. Um, we try very hard to listen to everyone and take into consideration um, everyone's um, ideas. I, I do think that um, there is um, a fundamental um, divide between um, kind of the recognition that there is a need for this level of care versus believing that everything can be served in the community. Um, so I think we did as much as we could to involve stakeholders. I think, um, you know, we, as I said, Vision 2030, we had over 300 participants. Um, we definitely talked about the secure residential. Not everyone agreed it was a great idea, but there are certainly folks that really do support and understand the need for this level of care. Um, the Adult State Standing Committee um, met and discussed this secure residential facility eight times between 2020 and 2021, and they provided feedback on everything from the colors of the spaces to the layout, functioning, concerns they had, plans to testify at the legislature, and updates on planning. Um, there was consumer input specifically on architectural design at three different community stakeholder meetings. Um, on May 13th and June 30th, 2020, and then again on March 4th, 2021. And then there certainly was a lot of testimony in front of the legislature, both for and against the facility. So we certainly don't come to you and say that there was brought, that everyone agreed that this was a good idea. Um, certainly there are a lot of people that do support this project. The legislature supported the project, um, but certainly there are folks that don't support the project. Okay, I wanted to follow up on a question that uh, member Pelham asked, and he was um, focusing on the Brattleboro retreat, and um, this kind of ties into that discussion somewhat in that um, I'm curious what the department um, felt happened to people during the pandemic because um, the Wyndham Center, which I think is nine or ten beds, was taken offline to go strictly for COVID use. And, um, you know, Brattleboro never could find the workforce. Uh, so that that was problematic. Um, did these people just defer care? I can answer that. Uh, so this is Samantha Sweet. And um, part of my role, I oversee the adult care management team. And so I have one staff that is data dedicated solely to triage. So her job is to triage people out of the emergency room into inpatient units, the most appropriate bed. Um, and so what we saw at the beginning of the pandemic was that no one went to emergency rooms. It was almost like no one left their home, no one was going anywhere. And so we saw numbers plummet um, uh, looking for inpatient settings. And then we found like probably Five, six months later, people started surfacing again and seeking inpatient treatment, but it was slow. It was slow going. 
And so what we're finding now is that we are experiencing kind of the, the mental health surge looking for inpatient beds. So our emergency rooms are definitely taking the brunt of that. And one of the decisions, we did have Wyndham Center as our COVID bed, uh, 10 bed for um, adults that had tested positive for COVID-19 and needed uh, inpatient services. Part of the decision to end that contract was that we really saw that the numbers went down significantly and we also needed those beds to come back online. And so we ended that contract with a Wyndham Center so those beds could be uh, utilized for general inpatient beds. But then we contracted with Springfield Emergency Department for two beds to carry us through an additional three months for anyone that tested positive that needed uh, mental health services. Um, and so they did that for about three months. And then uh, on July 30th, I think we ended that contract as we felt like we had been four months, almost five months with no one testing positive that needed inpatient units. So we're now, um, those resources are going into uh, general inpatient services. Um, so we are still, I know, you, as you know, we are still experiencing a huge number of inpatient beds being closed, and majority of those are due to staffing. So there's a lot of efforts being put forth to increase anything, any barriers to bringing new staff into those hospitals. Thank you. I think what I'm hearing you say that um, even if, and I'll say if, because I'm not completely sold that it's going to be uh, reopened uh, as quick as projected, but if Brattleboro Retreat actually opens the space where state dollars went to and staffs it properly, that it, it's this facility is still fully needed and the two are compatible and mutual. Yes, it definitely is. If uh, Brattleboro Retreat, hopefully, fingers crossed, <laughs> is open soon. They are level one. Those 12 new level one beds will be for inpatient use only. And so we need people from those units to be able to step down. And that's what the new secure residential will be, is for a step down from level one units. So... Over the years, you know, uh, having looked at a few of these projects, um, I think the last one as a legislator um, was for Berlin. And it seems that um, eight bed units seems to, to be the uh, magical number. And I'm just curious if um, there's industry literature that um, confirms that um, an eight bed pod is the most efficient. Um, in terms of um, operations and financial costs, but also therapeutic for the patient. Do you want to take that? Uh, do you know? I don't know. I am not sure anyone here knows the answer to that, uh, but we could get back to you on it. That would be great. And a follow up on that. Um, with your new negotiations on the, the waiver and everything, ha, has that whole IMD threshold of uh, not getting reimbursed um, for larger facilities, is that still in place or has it been removed? Or um, I guess that's the question. <laughs> this facility <clears throat> would not fall under the IMD exception because it's not a hospital. Um, and we're under the 16 beds. Um, in terms of the, I am, the status of the 1115 waiver negotiations in general with the state, those are being done at the AHS level, so I am not sure the particulars of those. Okay, so if the this was a 24-bed... So sorry. Go ahead. I was just, the goal of this facility is for it not to be considered an IMD so that we can use Medicaid funding. Okay, so even if it was 24 beds, it wouldn't jeopardize your funding? It would. It would? Yeah. Yes, it needs to be under the 16. Yes. Okay. 
Okay. And uh, how would your ability to downsize be impacted by things like um, uh, union contracts and things like that? If if you were only using, um, say, six or seven on a regular basis and you felt it necessary to um, close one of the pods, what's the stickiness there? Will the will the union contracts allow that? Um, how will that play out? Um, well, I, I think just closing, say, one wing doesn't mean you only need half the staff. So, for example, at BPCH right now, we have had C and D units closed um, for a long time because of COVID and because of staffing resources. We're still utilizing all of our staff. It still takes a lot of staff to man all of the units. So um, I think it would, if we permanently closed a unit or transitioned it to something else, then there would be staffing impacts. But I think if we just, if there were periods of time where it wasn't completely full, um, I don't think it would really impact our staffing patterns. You're really not, I think it's only a 10, there was only a 10% decrease in staff. I think when we looked at it, if we had an eight bed unit versus a 16 bed unit, you know, at one point, the legislature did ask us to explore what if we just build an eight bed unit, how much would it save? And it really wouldn't save that much because of the economy of sale, scale we were uh, utilizing on construction costs. And then staffing, I think, was only about a 10 percent reduction. So you still, you know, you still need all your kitchen staff. You still need all your admin staff. And because we're a 24 seven facility and there are always folks that need vacation or we see a lot of FEMLA or workers comp, you're, you're always needing to kind of fill those holes. OK. Um, of course, we all hope that, you know, there isn't the need and there's, you know, very few patients and things like that. But I, I think based on your answer, what you're telling me is that on a cost per patient basis, probably if it's if you've pegged the right number, the most efficient cost per patient is at the 16. Hmm. Yeah. OK, so I, I could hear it in some of my um, colleagues questions that they were troubled. You know, there was a lot in your presentation about what the legislature passed in into uh, statute and such. And yet there's, you know, there's a pretty scathing public comment. And part of that says that um, this will drive up um, the cost of care. Can you address that? Um, so I, um, I think we have touched on that. I, so clearly there will be a financial impact because we'll have greater operating costs. We do feel though that there is going to be cost savings that offset that because we're going to be able to move people out of inpatient hospital beds. Inpatient hospital beds are the most expensive beds for folks to be in, right? And right now you have any one time seven to 10 people waiting in those beds that don't need to be there. Utilize, so that's money that doesn't need, that's not an effective use of that, that money being spent, right? MTCR is a lower level of care and costs less per day. You also have people waiting in emergency departments. As we know right now, there's a lot of people waiting in emergency departments. That's very expensive. If you have adequate flow in the system, and again, we are not saying that the only thing we need is these secure beds and all of a sudden the magic, magically the system is going to flow. But what we're saying is this is going to really help the system because the folks that we're talking about are the folks that are really hard to transition. They are the most complex cases. There are serious, usually public safety issues that make it very difficult for them to go anywhere other than a secure setting. And so they're they're, they're kind of gumming up part of the system. And so if we can help with that system flow, you're going to save money on both ends. So this board has consistently um, made it very clear that we believe that um, parity should be real between um, behavioral and physical health. And um, what I think I'm hearing from you is the right care in the right setting is going to um, be better care for the patients because just like we would never expect to sit in an emergency room for days to have a broken a limb put into a cast, nobody should be stuck in a, in a hospital emergency room um, while they're waiting for the right setting. Am I interpreting you correctly? Absolutely, absolutely. 
Yes, we feel this is an essential level of care to assure that people who need this level of care are receiving it in a therapeutic setting. MTCR right now is not a therapeutic setting, right? It was meant to be a temporary facility. We've It's been eight years and we have done our best and we've had really good outcomes, but the individuals that need that level of care deserve a facility that is state of the art, that is therapeutic and that meets their needs. And everyone else also deserves to be able to move throughout the system quicker than is happening right now. Okay, that's all the questions I had, Laura. Great, um, I wanted to give the other board members an opportunity to ask any follow-up questions that might have arisen. Actually, I just have a quick one based on Kevin's uh, recent question. Can you just remind me the delta between the average cost per day of a patient on the wait list in an inpatient bed versus the average cost per day for a patient that uh, will be in this new residential facility? I mean, that's effectively the cost savings. Can you just remind me of that, Delta? Wait. Was it in the slides? It's, I'm not at my computer either because my computer shut off, so I can't find my notes. While you're looking, Karen, I just want to uh, comment that uh, I'm really starting to see um, both um, your dad and your grandfather in your features now. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> That's a good thing. That's a good thing. <laughs> um, we might have to get back to you on that. It was after your test. It was after my test? No, it was after. So I have it? Yeah. Okay, I'm being told it's in one of the slides. Okay, then I, I, I can look back. I just want to make Sorry. sure it's calculated for the type of care that a patient on the in an inpatient bed would be receiving if they're on the wait list, right? So I just, I'm just trying to make sure that that's mm -hmm. the calculation there. Oh, I, I have it. <laughs> this is in legislative testimony. Oh, okay, it's in legislative testimony, that's what it was. Okay, so can you repeat your question? So the sure. cost of I'm looking for the difference between the average cost per day for a patient that's in an inpatient setting, a level one setting on the wait list versus what the average cost per day for that same patient would be when they move to the residential facility. I'm trying to understand the actual cost savings. Yeah, okay. So um, every hospital is a little different, has a different per day rate. Um, so this is testimony from March. Um, and so it has VPCH at uh, $2,610 a day, the retreat at $1,776 a day, and uh, the Rutland South unit at $2,063 a day. Um, MPCR is $1,200 a day. Uh, we anticipate the new facility will probably be um, about $1,565 a day. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Yes. Yeah. And I think the retreat number has gone up a little bit since then with the new um, the new contract and the payment reform we've done with the retreat. Um, so that number is probably not accurate right now, but the others I think are about accurate. So about 500 bucks a day, give or take. Okay, thank you. Any other board members? Okay, then um, I think we're all set with that and we will proceed to the public comment portion of the hearing. Um, I will give the healthcare advocate an opportunity to speak again if they would like. Um, no, no? no further questions, thank you. Great. Um, is there a representative of Mad Freedom here who would like to make a comment? Okay, um, is there a representative of Disability Rights Vermont here who would like to make a comment? Uh, yes. 
Great. Um, uh, please uh, go ahead and state your name for the record. Zachary Hosen. You may proceed. Thank you so much. Um, thank you all for being here today and for this opportunity. Um, just a couple of, of points I want to make on behalf of Disability Rights Vermont. Um, you know, I'll start off by saying that generally we agree that there has to be the, the secure facility has to be built um, and that the current placement in Middlesex is not an appropriate place. Um, and so we're grateful that the state is looking at, at how to replace that facility. Um, but we are, do have a lot of concerns about the current proposed project. Um, we're concerned that it's, it's too large. Um, we're not convinced that there's really a justification for, for 16 locked beds. Um, and just really want to emphasize that you know, legally there's a duty to provide uh, treatment in the most community integrated setting possible. Um, you know, as provided by the integration mandate of the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Vermont Fair Housing Public Accommodations Act. Um, and it's important for health outcomes, as was discussed earlier, for people to be in the community and receiving as much um, the community setting. There was some discussion about whether this is a, a community placement or an institution. And I can tell you from the perspectives of the in, of the, the residents, um, it's an institution. It's, it doesn't feel very different from, from them, from what I hear, um, from a hospital. Um, you know, they're, they're still locked away from the community. They don't have access to the community. People have to come to them. They can't go out. They can't, um, they can't be working, can't be looking at apartments. Um, they're very restricted in, in what they can do in their movements and their ability to to live their life in the community. Um, so you know, from their perspective, it really feels like uh, an institution where they're locked in because they are locked in. Um, you know, the, it's also clear from all of this that our mental health system needs way more resources on on you know, every sort of level in the continuum of care. Um, and we're concerned that there's there's we're putting too much at uh, this high, very high end, as opposed to more into, into the community. Um, and we're, you know, there's a concern that there's been discussion about people waiting in, in hospitals for, um, to get out of hospitals. And, um, you know, th there was discussion about individuals are, are unable to be served in the community. And I haven't really heard a discussion of, of why that is. And really is this, you know, is adding um adding this more secure beds is that really the solution uh, to addressing the problem of people not being able to be served in the community are there aspects of commu other community placements that just need to be enhanced uh, so that individuals can be served in the community and not in a locked setting um, since we really encourage there to be more more discussions and deliberation analysis of that um, the other thing that, that we haven't heard much of that was concerning in terms of the backlog of, of uh, you know the lack of flow through the system you know are there individuals stuck at the current secure facility that could be receiving services in the more in the community um and that they're you know for lack of community resources they're stuck in, the, in that placement and um you know from our experience that is that does occur uh, and the question would be how how much does that occur and would adding more secure beds just increase that problem um, again, we don't want people being stuck at any point in this system. We want them as integrated in the community as possible throughout. Um, so those are those are DRVT Disability Rights Vermont's concerns and um, thoughts we'd like to share with with this board and, and with the community. Um, so that I will. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and now I will open it up to the public. Um, I um, will uh, call on people as I see either hands physically raised or raised through the team function. Um, and uh, um, if you're here on behalf of an organization, please state the name of the organization and provide your comment. Um, and um, I'll call first on uh, Representative Donahue. Um, thank you very, very much. Thank you, um, members of the board, for your uh, careful attention and, and excellent questions. Um, I, I'm not here on the behalf of, uh, of anyone. I'm not here on behalf of the, I would say, somewhat dispirited uh, survivor or consumer um, folks 
folks who uh, felt their voices were not heard, um, or on behalf of the legislature, which is obviously out of session, but um, on behalf of myself, both as a person who uh, has the lived experience of uh, severe mental illness, uh, characterized as a psychiatric survivor, and also as a legislature, legislator who is very deeply involved in the legislative process uh, regarding um, this uh, residence um, from the uh, House Health Care Committee. I, I really want to um, touch on two things. First is responses to some of the comments and slides from the Department of Mental Health. And then secondly, um, the specific requests that I made of the board for conditions on the CON in my um, uh, public written comments. I'm not going to uh, reiterate the, the um, discussions in those comments, but just focus on um, in response to the slides, uh, I, I think I want to touch on both what was said, but also what was not. Um, there was a lot of emphasis on stakeholder input. Um, input doesn't mean support. The Vision 2030 uh, work, and I was in the think tank, which um, I think it was about 20% uh, of the members, uh, not a majority, who were actual consumers. Um, there was a huge amount of support for community programs and a shift to more community resources. Um, if you read the Vision 2030 report, I do not think there's any reference to the secure, and I would suggest no members of the think tank discussed or considered um, this facility as a community investment. Um, secondly, um, the slides referenced Act 26 and the residential needs report that was completed. Yes, that report supported the need for additional secure recovery residence beds, um, but that equally or even more related to the cause of people stuck in inpatient beds, that flow, that emergency room out is the fact that group homes were close to 100% capacity across the system and supported community residences, residential uh, um, apartments and so forth with, with supported um, staff um, are desperately in need of expansion. Those folks are also stuck in inpatient beds. They're not the same people, they have different needs, but they are also stuck in inpatient beds, blocking people from accessing uh, the care they need. There were hours of testimony in the legislatures by stakeholders, virtually none of them, um, other than uh, hospital and DMH testimony were in support, um, not only by um, psychiatric survivor and advocates, but by the community mental health. Uh, the designated agency system testified um, not supporting uh, the expansion beds. Everyone agrees the current beds need a replacement, but the expansion of um, the uh, department uh, on one of its slides argued there's no adverse impact on other services um, and specifically said because it replaced the only such program. Uh, um, but obviously there's a significant increase, more than a doubling of the cost um, because of the increased beds. The fact is that one of the underlying disparities that blocks any kind of parity in mental health services in the state is that there is a far greater fixed budget that controls uh, those investments. When you increase costs in one part of the system, it reduces the availability of resources for other parts of the system. Increasing this cost will decrease other costs, and I'll, I'll touch on that more later. Um, in terms of uh, criteria number nine that they referenced, uh, the equivalence to other uh, services, the parity issue uh, that begins on their slide uh, 60, they focus in responding to that on individual care, the integration of care for individuals, but not on systemic issues. When it takes two months waiting to see a community mental health provider people's damage said when acute needs go unmet, there's a cascade of quality. Absolutely. Um, but when needs, needs become acute, when they are unmet at lower levels, we have a crisis in access to care at lower levels. Where have you heard of this before? 
our entire healthcare system reform is on a shift to lower level primary care to reduce costs and keep people out of the highest levels of care, of which this is identified by DMH as the second highest level of care. Mental health consistently goes backwards from the, uh, the reform efforts and the all payer model which focus on investing in the lower levels to prevent the need for higher levels. Um, and so that relates to the specific requests I'm making of the board in terms of conditions to the CON. As I've said, there's no question of the need to replace middle sex. But if this is to expand to 16 beds, then and I would really urge three. The first is to be really explicit that this is any not in a community system or the community mental health system based care. It's a budget issue, not a licensing issue. Um, slide 25, the, which is my chart, says it, it's saying, look at our investments. See, this is what we put in the community. This is what we put in inpatient care. Uh, and they're suggesting this is community care, not inpatient care. But if you look at every other criteria than the, the licensing, they have consistently, they share the staff between the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital and the Middlesex Therapeutic Residence. They're trained to give staff. The construction costs, it was a question about the benchmark. If you want to look at the benchmark, the cost for an inpatient is a million or a million plus per bed. That's not what you pay to build a community residence. The cost per day that was referenced is much closer to an inpatient cost. In fact, than cost, but on those upper levels of care, it is much closer than that to that than a typical community residential placement. It has always been considered as inpatient a ten bed. Every time we talk about the replacement for the Vermont State Hospital, we talk about their having Excuse me, been Representative four beds. Yes. I, I just I, I'm having I'm having a hard time hearing that you're coming in and out. I don't know if that's happening for other people. If it is, um, I, I think uh, it's important that you get heard. So, yeah, I was going to ask the court. So let me the turn. Question. Yeah. Are, are you able to understand Representative Donahue? No, I can't hear it either. That's just what happens on these um, remote hearings. So, um, so I, I, I suggest that you turn uh, off your camera and just use your voice. Yes, thank you. Thank you for uh, asking asking that. I've turned it off and I'll, I'll just um, go back just on the points of, of why this is an institutional level facility, not a community residence in every way except for licensing. And that licensing is not the issue I'm raising. It's about budget and philosophy. Um, the Middlesex facility has consistently shared staff with VPCH. They're trained together. The construction benchmark is what it costs to build a hospital, uh, not a community residence. The cost per day is much more in line with hospital inpatient costs. You were given the comparison to level one care, but other inpatient care needs to also be reviewed because the gap then before you drop down to actual community-based care is very different. It has always been considered a replacement for the Vermont State Hospital beds. There used to be 52 Vermont State Hospital beds. It has constantly been reiterated and, and on line charts for bed replacements, 45 level one and seven middle sex uh, residential secure recovery, making 52 that replace the 54. This is what everyone has understood and it has always been. Um, this is a state run facility it's the only other facility rather other than inpatient where there is a specific court order required for the level of care that you cannot leave uh, unless you're accompanied by staff that's surrounded by a fence, a large high fence, which is not shown in the illustrations you see. And finally, it is an IMD, an Institute for Mental Disease, just like a hospital. Um, as DMH acknowledged, it can't be more than 16 beds because it's it's not 
it's it's an IMD and it's in that classification. Um, so I think that's that's really crucial that um, we recognize that this is not an investment in the shift from institutional care to community-based and primary lower levels of care um, that we're trying to achieve in our system. Even when you look at our nursing home system and those facilities, our focus is trying to get people in home-based facilities, not in more institutional facilities. Um, why is that important? It's critically important because the next time around, when DMH comes wanting to build another facility, they're going to say, look at our balance of investments. Look at what we're putting in community-based care. It's going to appear to be growing. That's not an accurate picture if this is misclassified. The community system is starving. People can't access community care. And the department consistently says it's about yes and. The department says we recognize all these other needs. Yes and. That's really nice, but it's never the reality. It's always yes, but first. Yes, but first. We need to build this. We need to build 12 new level beds, level one beds in Brattleboro. Um, yes, but first. And I understand the needs that they are pushing to resolve. We need to accurately identify them as building blocks for the future if we're trying to really have an integrated system that works towards healthcare reform in the same way by meeting lower level needs to prevent higher level needs. My second key request is that the board require compliance with the legislature's direction. The legislature was very split on whether there was an adequate showing of the need to increase to 16 beds. And the outcome of that split was to say, yes, 16, but only if they are fully separable. You have that separable unit so that if the needs as they evolve are identified to be two subsets of folks who should not be living in common beyond the fact that if you're calling it a residence, nobody lives with 16 uh, different other people. Um, you know, an eight bed residential component just has a better feel to it. But um, the legislature wanted that ability for them to function separately. Um, no, they did not want a costly redesign, but at that time, Rooms were still being changed in size and in location. DMH met with me, talked about design and relocation. At that time, room sizes were still changing. Uh, building walls were changing. Uh, office wings were becoming larger or smaller and so forth. That was all still happening in terms of the ability to do what was being asked. Uh, you, each wing has a laundry room. If only one wing has access to its laundry room uh, when the fire door is closed, when the fire door is closed, you can't get to your laundry. When your fire door is closed, you cannot get to the serenity room, which is supposed to be something by the program description that folks can access at any time when they want a quiet space separate from the hubbub of the, the living room area. Um, so, you know, it may not be in huge degrees, but there was a recognized lack of meeting that uh, request. Um, the third piece is a relatively, uh, relatively small one, um, and that is about people with lived experience. There was a reference to three different meetings about architecture and design and fit up. As the department knows, most of the time in that meeting was taken up by people who were extremely concerned about this happening at all. Um, I don't think the voices of people who would like to discuss uh, what sorts of furniture should be there, whether, whether more of the space should be carpeted for a more residential feel, should be closed off based on saying, well, you folks took up all your time uh, talking about why you were opposed. So um, too bad that you didn't comment on this. Um, some people don't want to comment. They feel that it shouldn't be happening and they don't want to comment, but some do. And I was stunned to see that there was a 
purchasing list already locked in for furniture. When you look at the slides, that is hospital furniture. That is inpatient care furniture. It has all the accoutrements of people who need inpatient care in terms of non-ligature and, and institutional look and so forth. Um, I, I think the department should be required to have to not jump over that step and give not just a committee like the standing committee, but but allow for a public meeting where people are able to give input into those, um, you know, physical environmental um, final uh, decisions. So um, those are my three requests that this not be documented, recorded, identified as being a community-based investment. That on that little pie chart, it goes on the inpatient state-run side, um, that it be fully able to be two separable residential wings um, for that flexibility of use, uh, and that there be a meeting with interested anyone interested regarding uh, furnishings, uh, carpeting, um, various other elements like that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I see right now I see one hand raised and that is Dale Hackett. Would you like to go? Hi, my name is Dale Hackett for the record. Can you hear me? I can. OK, um, the, my first comment would be I really don't like the fire door solution. Sounds like it makes more sense on paper than it will in reality. Um, I don't know what the answer is, but somebody needed a solution. They found one on paper and I think when they actually see it physically, this doesn't sound like a good solution. Um, I'll leave that one alone. I have some other doubts. I, I think there are some other things that are looking good on paper, but aren't going to be so good in reality. Uh, one, you still don't know. We, we're still in a pandemic. Whatever you've calculated your needs at, that's dynamic and going to change going forward. But I think that's something we all know, um, whether we talk about it or not. Uh, the other is I would question what community-based services is in this situation for this level of care. Am I looking to get these people an apartment in downtown Montpelier as my ultimate goal of what community-based is with services provided? Um, I've never really seen it well-defined what community-based services is for this population. I have strong reservations about not just whether or not you'll have vacancies in the beds or actually more need, demand than beds available, um, which is a likely scenario. I think it could happen. I also think you're going to have a workforce issue. Um, if you're tied to Medicaid, there is a limit as to how much you can pay. And that doesn't mean that you're going to get the workforce. Uh, you just won't be able to pay them enough if that's all connected to the fact that this is supported by Medicaid. Therefore, there's a limit as to what we can pay. The housing issue is far more critical, I think, than people are giving it credit for. It's not just affordability, it's availability. Um, you can't even find the housing. I'm, I'm reading the reports all the time, especially students coming back to college. There is no housing. Never mind the cost. Can you even find one to say it's unaffordable? They're coming back and saying there is no housing. So I strongly question that as well. Even if you could hire people to come and work here, um, where are they going to live? And then the other issue that could come up is, are they going to have daycare? 
Are they going to have a school? And right now, those are crucial issues. Uh, so I'm just, I'll, I'll finish with that. Looks good on paper. I have a lot of doubts. That simplifies my whole comment. I, I'm not going to get into more detail. I think that really does generalize it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, is there anyone else who would like to make a comment at this time? Okay, um, at this point, um, we would like to uh, thank everyone for your participation, and um, I think I can uh, turn it back over to Chair Mullen. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> And thank you, Laura, and thank you, everyone. A lot of information to digest, and uh, um, there is an open public comment period now, and um, anyone can um, make those public comments. Um, so if you think of something um, later, um, feel free to um, just log on to that public comment uh, period on our website and uh, do so. Um, with that, thank you for all the participants. And at this time, is there any new business to come before the board? Is there any old business to come before the board? I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Thank you everyone and have a great rest of the day.